Greetings and salutations. This should be a fun video for those of you who like numbers and statistics. We're going to talk about who uses Ubuntu and on what they are using it. A first look at desktop metrics was posted in the Ubuntu blog from Will Cook. Will Cook is the head of desktop development for Canonical. And of course, in February, they announced that they would be collecting a little bit of anonymous information from people who install Ubuntu on their computers. This naturally started a huge flame war because some people in the community stood up and said that Canonical was overstepping bounds and they wanted to collect too much private information and that the next thing they would ask for would be your mother's maiden name, your children's names, uh, social security number, license number on your car, home address, and all that kind of stuff. Well, no, that's not what they asked for at all. It's very basic anonymous information that's being sent back to Ubuntu and I said from the very beginning that I was in total support of this because it helps the developers and they have not overstepped any bounds nor does it appear like they're going to. So let's take a look at some of the first information that Will Cook has shared. These are statistics that have come back from the metrics that have been collected thus far. And he goes in here and explains how it works. And he shows you that after the install there, when the little welcome screen pops up, you get this little tool and you can opt in or opt out. Now, even if you opt out, a little ping goes back to canonical servers that says, hey, this turkey's going to be a jerk and he's not going to share this basic information that will help us, even though he just downloaded and installed the operating system for free. But anyway, they want to know some sort of percentage of people who are willing to you know, share this information and who isn't. And so anyway, da 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 they said that 67% of the people who uh, installed Ubuntu went ahead and shared the information. I have shared it every time that I've installed it, playing around with it, just, hey, because like I said, I think it helps. So the first interesting sort of piece of data that we get out of this is how long does it take to install Ubuntu? I have told people for years that with Ubuntu and Linux Mint that you're looking at somewhere around, you know, average is going to be 15, 15 to 20 minutes and uh, it could take anywhere from 10 minutes to an hour depending on how fast your hardware is and what kind of an internet connection you got. So they came up with 18 minutes. That sounds about right and they said they're going to look at ways to optimize that. Fresh installs versus upgrades. This is another thing that's kind of interesting. The number of people upgrading an existing Ubuntu installation is about a quarter of those who are installing 1804 LTS from scratch. Now, I always tend to lean toward nuking and paving if I can, which means go ahead and back up all your data off of the computer wipe it clean and then start over if you're going to do an upgrade. In place upgrades sometimes they tend to be messy. So I'm not really surprised at that number anyway. But what is kind of interesting is that they say that they have not prompted people to upgrade because the point one release is not out yet and that's coming up on July the 26th though so 1804.1 is going to come out and at that point those of you who are running Ubuntu 16.04 or 1710, you're going to get that little notice that says, hey, new version is out, you want to upgrade? That's when it's going to happen. Installer options. Now, this kind of caught me by surprise here. Uh, with Ubuntu 1804, it has shipped with the download updates option checked in the installer. I have never downloaded the updates during the install. I may have done it in a video here to demonstrate it, but the reason why I've never done that is because if you check this install updates, it gets some of the updates at install. And then as soon as the desktop is booted up, guess what it does? It prompts you to install more updates. So uh, my attitude has always been, hey, let's make it real easy. Get the thing installed, set up. Don't have it go out dragging stuff off the internet, which is going to make that take longer. And then once it gets installed, I will update the system and make sure that everything is up to date. But most people have left that checked. Uh, the restricted extras, 53.43%. No, this is restricted add-ons. This is not restricted extras. Restricted extras is a package that you can install after. Let's make sure we get that straight. But anyway, 53.43% of the people have checked that box. That brings in basic codecs so you can listen to certain kinds of music files and patent encumbered video formats. And it used to pull in the Flash installer, you know, the... Uh, flash video but I don't think that does that there anymore I think to get that now you have to install Ubuntu restricted extras 
Of course, the only downside to that is that pulls in that wonderful Fluendo MP3 codec that doesn't do anything but make MP3s sound bad. So you'll go buy the Fluendo MP3s uh, codecs for $35. You don't need that at all. Do a search for a package called GStreamer 1.0 Fluendo MP3. And when you find that, just delete it. When you do that, everything will sound fine because the regular GStreamer MP3 codecs will kick in after that and they sound good. I always point that out whenever talking about this in Ubuntu because I really wish Ubuntu would drop that because they don't need it anymore. Although in some countries I think they still do because if you're going to offer people the option to install that, legally speaking, <laughs> they really can't distribute that without having some way for you to actually pay for it. I know it's stupid. 28.25% go for auto login. That's interesting. I don't recommend that at all when you install Ubuntu or any Linux or any operating system for that matter. I think the machine should prompt you for a password when you sit down at it and boot it up or have it wake up from uh, suspend because if you're just having it auto log in, that means you're just telling anybody who gets access to that machine, hey, here you go. You can look at whatever I got. You can have it. I don't care. And it's, you know, the only time that I've ever set up an auto login was for my mom. She lives alone. She lives by herself. And I wanted to make things simple for her. So she has one. But other than that, all the other machines that I have worked on or worked with, I've always said, hey, you know, take a second and log in and make sure you're safe. You never know. Somebody might steal your computer. CPU count. Now, we're talking about CPUs, not cores. The vast majority of computers out there have one. CPU, a few have two, and four show up as well. These are installing Ubuntu desktop versions, folks. So I'm wondering who's out there who has a machine with four individual CPUs in it that's installing Ubuntu as a desktop. So they said in the future that they'll look at cores, but there's nothing surprising about that one. Disk partitioning schemes. This also is no surprise to me at all. Most people who install Ubuntu choose to erase the disk and install. That means blow everything completely off the disk. The next one down is manual. Manual would, would be people who want to create a separate home partition or they need to uh, put Ubuntu into a drive that already has a bunch of other partitions in it. So that's telling me that there's a lot of folks out there who know a little bit about disks and partitions and setting up Linux who are using Ubuntu. In the last video I said that Ubuntu had become more of an advanced user's distribution. We're talking about regular vanilla Ubuntu. and Yes it has. That's, that's pretty obvious there. And then you see how few people actually set up LVMs or encrypted LVMs or uh, that sort of thing. So very interesting little spec specifications here. I always tell people if they're just starting out just let this thing, just let it wipe and install. I mean, if you only got one hard drive in the machine and we don't have to do anything like stick your home partition over here or whatever, just let it wipe and install. Start from scratch. It's the easiest way to go. Displays here. Full HD 1080p is the most popular screen resolution, followed by 1366 by 768, a common laptop resolution. So that tells you who's, you know, what we're looking at here. Of course, that's not surprising, 4K screens, even though... Uh, in all of the tech, everybody jumps up and down and says how wonderful they are. They are still very expensive. And a lot of people, when looking at that option, go, hmm, no thanks, and they just move on. So that is no surprise there at all. Then we have the number of GPUs in the system. Surprisingly, a lot of systems have two. And uh, they say here in the notes that, uh, or Will says rather, that that could be for cryptocurrency mining or gaming or whatever. Uh, but the vast majority have one. And then as far as the number of monitors, <laughs> guess what? Most people use one. I already knew that. Even though we hear a lot about uh, systems with uh, the, the multiple monitor support. You know, I mean, okay, yeah. That's important, but the vast majority of systems out there, people have one monitor. You know what I'm saying? It just is what it is. Now, this is kind of an interesting statistic to look at. This is RAM. And you notice that there are bumps where you have the average amount of RAM that is shipped with a, a computer, you know, like what the manufacturer sends out. Uh, so I was kind of surprised to see how many systems. This is Ubuntu desktop we're looking at here with the GNOME desktop. And it's kind of surprising 
how many systems out there have one gigabyte of RAM? I thought that would be a lot loader. And then look at two. That's pretty big, too. The vast majority of systems that Ubuntu is being run on have four gigabytes of RAM. That's, you know, everybody, you know, you're talking, the, you hear this garbage all the time from the, the really, the, you know, the tech heads, the nerds out there in the tech press. Oh, you know, uh, entry level these days for RAM on a system is 16 gigabytes. And I couldn't imagine using a computer with less than 16 gigabytes of RAM. That would just be very limiting. Look at this. Most of the people here are using four. Of course, now eight is pretty big, too. But remember, those are RAM sizes that are just easily available from the manufacturers. There they are. And then we have a bump here at 16. And when we get up here to 32, everybody's talking about 32 and 64. Look at how few of the machines are actually running just uh, 32 gigabytes of RAM compared to the other uh, kinds there. 4 and 8, definitely the biggest. 2 is big, too. And, uh, of course, this 12 gigabytes of RAM, that's from me reinstalling Ubuntu like maybe uh, 20 times on this machine. I have skewed this particular <laughs> metric simply because of the fact that uh, the machine that I'm doing this video on has 12 gigabytes of RAM on it, and I've installed Ubuntu on it many, many times. Uh, Ubuntu is used all over the world, man. Well, we knew that. That's pretty cool. And said that, uh, where is it? It said Brazil, India, China, and Russia are also big users of Ubuntu. Uh, the U.S. has the biggest concentration, which that kind of surprises me just a little tiny bit. And the reason why is because in my head, I have always thought that Ubuntu was much bigger in Europe and the U.K. and India and that part of the world. I, I, I just, for some reason, was under the impression that in the U.S. that there weren't, uh, you know, Ubuntu was not as widely used but I guess I was wrong it just I guess I was wrong that's all there was to it I just had the impression that it was more I, I, known about in Europe and uh, in other places around the world than it was in the US because the average person walking down the street you know uh, they're not going to be able to you know you walk up to them and go what's Ubuntu they'll probably look at you and go I don't know uh, so anyway that was very interesting to look at and I want to thank Will Cook for posting that information and uh, I think it's a, a good thing to take a walk through. And it, it really, uh, I, I, you know, I have this picture in my head because I work with a lot of people, have worked with a lot of people over the last couple of years of what kind of hardware that they're installing on. And guess what? This lines up with what I my experience has been forever is that it's not high-end hardware. It's not the super-duper latest, greatest that people are working with. They're working with last-generation stuff. They are looking at Linux as a way to extend the life of older machines, like Windows 7-type machines, or even if they're buying new machines, they're not going for the... the biggest thing in the world as far as uh, RAM and CPU capability and 4K monitors and stuff like that. No, they're doing basic run-of-the-mill machines, you know, four, 4 gigs of RAM, which to me, even today, 4 gigs of RAM is a little bit limiting. I've got uh, one machine in the house that runs 4 gigs of RAM. The kids use it for really light gaming and YouTube and things like that, and it works, but that machine, of course, wouldn't be a good candidate for doing anything like playing serious games on it, or uh, you definitely wouldn't want to uh, run virtual machines. But the truth of the matter is, is that the bulk of the users out there, they don't do that kind of stuff. It's you guys who are all into gaming and you guys who are all into development and running virtual machines and having server farms running in VMs and stuff like that and need all of this hardware. We, we're in the very much in the minority. And... So there it is, and which is kind of, like I said, unfortunate because a lot of the tech stuff is right on the bleeding edge, and they're saying, oh, you need 64 gigabytes of RAM. No, you don't. So this kind of tells me uh, what I already knew, and it gives me numbers to point to when I'm arguing with tech heads about it, which is actually very interesting in and of itself. So thank you for watching the video. I certainly do appreciate it. As always, your feedback is very welcome. Please be sure to give Easy Linux a like on Facebook. That's if you are a Facebook user. Also, check out 
EasyLinux.com. That's sort of a clearinghouse for all of this stuff. It's where you can see where the latest videos are posted under news and any other information comes up there. Also, there's a link to the Facebook page right there on the front page and uh, more goodies for you to get into. You can also contact me directly there. Also, check out FreedomPenguin.com for more about Linux from contributors such as myself. And uh, Matt Hartley has been kind enough to share content from the Easy Linux Project for quite some time. And he shares his own content, and other people share content. It's really kind of groovy, man. It almost feels like, wow. Check it out, FreedomPenguin.com. I'm gone. Talk to you all again soon.